Well, praise God. It's good to be here tonight. Hallelujah. I've never, uh, I've never felt such resistance uh, like I felt tonight before this Bible study. I mean, about two hours before coming here, I began to feel very ill. But you know what? The, uh, the devil has no authority in this place. Jesus Christ has all authority. And he's given that authority to us, the church. And we're exercising that authority tonight in this house. And we're telling the devil that you've got to leave this place right now. In Jesus' name, you have no right here. You have no authority here. Hallelujah. And God, we ask you, Lord, to let your spirit move in a mighty way tonight, God. Oh, hallelujah. God, we pray that you would open our understanding tonight, God, so that we can move deeper, Lord, into your prophetic word, oh God. Hallelujah. In Jesus' mighty name we pray tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Um, I don't know. I think we could uh, put that title up here tonight. Praise the Lord. I want to bring to you tonight, attempt to bring to you, Bible prophecy and the end time. But uh, uh, let me uh, explain to you how I uh, decided to go down this path. Um, <clears throat> now, normally I don't pray a prayer like this, but for some reason I did when I was preparing for this uh, Bible study. I prayed and I said, God, if it be your will, would you send me a dream or a vision to let me know which direction I need to go in? So about two days after I prayed that prayer, guess what? I received a vision from the Lord. Now you know that there's a saying that says, uh, be careful what you ask for. I think that may apply here. Because the, the vision I received wasn't what I was asking for. Praise God. But if God gives us a vision, we have to go with it. Amen? Praise God. So in this vision, I saw, well, I saw people. and But two people came to my attention. And one was a, a man. And uh, as I saw him, he... Uh, he began to look very strange, and he, he ended up fainting. And as I looked at him a second time to find out what was going on, I realized that he had fainted from fear. And then I saw a woman, and I saw her face, and I saw such fear and shock in her face that she put her hand over her mouth to keep from crying out by from what she was witnessing. And after I had this vision, it began to dawn on me what I was seeing. So could you put up Luke 21, 26? Here, this is Jesus speaking, and he's talking about the things that will happen before he returns. Amen? Amen. It says, men will faint from terror, apprehension of what is coming upon the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And uh, another translation talks about, the instead of heavenly bodies, it talks about the powers of heaven will be shaken. But that phrase, will be shaken, means that it is a, a catastrophic time taking place. <clears throat> But when I had that vision, it, it, I realized that what I was seeing as I was seeing Luke 21, 26 come to life right before my very eyes. Praise God. Now, I know that God has a reason for everything. He has a purpose for everything that he does. 
and he doesn't do anything without a reason. Praise God. So it, it's up to me to find out what that reason is. Amen? So I believe that this vision is where God is t trying to get our attention. And I don't know when these things will take place, but it was as if God was telling me that these things are real and they will come to pass. Praise God. So I, I believe that God wants us to understand that tough times may be ahead. And this is what I'm feeling now. I'm not saying that God spoke this to me, but what I'm feeling is maybe that the rapture is closer than what we might think. So we need to be aware of God's prophetic timetable. But the one thing that came from this vision that I felt was when I saw these people, I saw that the fear that was upon them, but there was no fear upon me at all. I felt the peace of God. So that tells me that in the end times that fear will come upon the world, but it will not come upon the church. Amen? God will have his umbrella of protection over us. Praise God. So I know that there are people that are not interested in in Bible prophecy because I've talked to them over the years those type of people and one of the things they say well there's there's it has nothing to do with salvation so I'm really not interested in studying it and there's other people that say well I've tried studying Bible prophecy but it I really don't understand it so I don't want to spend my time studying something that I don't understand but if there's anyone here tonight that may think that way, I'd ask you to consider this, that one-third of the Bible is prophecy. Amen? And it's been said by people a lot smarter than me that 90% of those prophecies will take place in the end time. And that's the time that we're in today. <clears throat> now you add to that what the book of Revelation says, it says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So I really don't see how we can ignore Bible prophecy for the spirit of truth and the spirit of prophecy are one and the same. Amen? Praise God. What, I, what I'd like to do tonight is take a very brief look at the books of Daniel and Revelation. More specifically, the second chapter of Daniel and the second and third chapter of Revelation. So I believe if God gave us the books of Daniel and, Revel Daniel and Revelation, that, that he would want us to study them. And at least make an attempt to understand them. For I believe that if we keep at it, God will open our understanding. And isn't that what he did with his disciples? He said that he would open their understanding so that they would comprehend the scriptures. And if God did that for them, I believe he can do that for us. Praise God. So that's what I want to do tonight is to touch on the basics, the very basics of Bible prophecy. And then ask God when we finish here tonight, we're going to pray and ask God to open our, our understanding so that we might move into things that are deeper in the spirit. <clears throat> Praise God. So let me clarify that when we talk about the end time, we're not referring to the end of time. We're talking about uh, the end time, which means the end of this age. This is spoken about in, in uh, the book of Daniel. Praise God. So if you go to Daniel 12, verses 8 and 9. This is Daniel speaking. He said, although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said... My Lord, what shall be the end of these things? So here God was telling Daniel that a time of trouble would come upon his people, but it would be some time in the future. But even though Daniel was a prophet, he didn't understand. <clears throat> but why didn't he understand? Verse 9 tells us, it says, And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. So that <clears throat> tells us that God sealed the words. And why would he do that? He did it to keep man from understanding it. Amen? 
So until such a time where the words would be unsealed, and the Bible calls that the time of the end. <clears throat> so we know to be this for uh, we know this to be the case for if you go back and study history, you can see that the people for generations have tried to understand the prophecies in Daniel and Revelation, but they were not able to do so. But many of the prophecies that were not able to understand then are able to be understood now. And why is that? Are people more intelligent today? I, I really don't think so. I believe the reason for that is found in the scripture which I just read. When God said to Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. <clears throat> and I believe we're in the time of the end today. So Jesus could return at any time. Amen? Praise God. <clears throat> so how do we know this? I, I don't know if you remember, but last December, I had a word for the church. I said that in 2019 would be a time of winnowing. And God would separate the wheat from the chaff. Praise God. And I, I laid out God's prophetic timetable then. And I just want to mention it again. <clears throat> if you look back through time, you'll find that about every 2,000 years, a major event in the plan of God takes place. 6,000 years ago, Adam and Eve were created. 4,000 years ago, Abraham was born, who was the father of God's chosen people. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ was born. And today, we stand on the brink of the next major move of God. And could the next major move of God be the rapture of the church? I believe it could be. For Acts 1.11 says, The same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Praise God. <clears throat> but... Even during the end time, the majority of the people in the world will not understand what's taking place. For if you look at the next verse, Daniel 12, 10, it says, Many shall be purified, made white, and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So I, I don't know about you, but I want to be one of those that understands what God is doing in the end time. Praise God. <clears throat> now the, the prophecy which lays the foundation for the events that would take place in our time was given some 2,600 years ago. It was given in the form of a dream to Nebuchadnezzar, the pagan king of Babylon. <clears throat> now this, this is amazing to me in itself. Now just think about that. If you were going to give somebody a prophecy that would affect the world for thousands of years, would you give that dream that depicts that prophecy to a pagan king? <clears throat> but that's exactly what God did. It's recorded in the second chapter of Daniel. Praise God. So God does things that sometimes that we don't expect him to do. So this dream depicted a great image, as you have read, I'm sure. The head was of gold, the breast and arms were of silver, belly and thighs were of brass, legs of iron, and feet of iron mixed with clay. But then it says that a stone, which was cut out without hands, smote the image upon the feet. Now that's, that's a critical part of the prophecy because it, it's speaking about what, is, what is, may take place in our day. So that means something to us, praise God. So it goes on to say that it broke the entire image into pieces. Then the stone which struck the image grew until it became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Praise God. I think we know who that stone was. Amen. <clears throat> so now the interpretation was given to Daniel in Daniel 236 through 45 praise God <clears throat> so I'm I'm going somewhere so just uh, stick with me here praise God uh, 
verse 36. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom, inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over the, all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they shall not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings... The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and the interpretation is sure. Praise God. Hallelujah. <clears throat> so Daniel here is speaking of five kingdoms or, or empires which will rule the entire world throughout history. Praise God. And <clears throat> no matter what kingdom rises or falls, God is still in charge. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Now the, the first kingdom depicted in Nebuchadnezzar's uh, dream is represented by the head of gold praise god this was nebuchadnezzar's babylon but even though this was the most powerful kingdom on the earth at the time praise god <clears throat> it fell in 539 bc lasting only 66 years the second kingdom represented by brass and arms of breast and arms of silver was the empire of the medes and the persians the empire dominated the world for 200 years and it fell in 331 BC. The third kingdom represented by the belly and thighs of brass. Praise God. This is the Grecian Empire ruled by Alexander the Great. It ruled for 134 years falling in 197 BC. <clears throat> then began the rule of the Roman Empire. Praise God. That's the empire that ruled the earth when Jesus was here walking the earth. Praise God. So it ruled for 500 years until it decayed from within. <clears throat> but then all of that brings us to the last part of the image. The prophecy states that one more kingdom would rule the earth. And you'll notice that each time it moves from one kingdom to the next, that each section becomes a completely different metal. Praise God. But this last kingdom is different from all the rest represented by the feet consists of two elements mixed together one iron and the other clay this mixture indicates that the element of iron or the roman empire would survive however another element clay praise god would be mixed in the clay is what would make this kingdom different than all the rest <clears throat> praise god so I know that there's many interpretations of Daniel, but I'm sticking with the one that makes most sense to me. After the Roman Empire came another empire, which was related but different. This last empire would be called the Holy Roman Empire. The Roman elephant element would survive, but something else would be mixed with it. Now everything begins to fall into place when you come to the conclusion that the clay represents the apostate church in the end time. 
In order to understand this part of the prophecy, we have to understand the difference between the Roman Empire and the Holy Roman Empire. Amen? <clears throat> so they're not the same. Praise God. Stick with me here. Praise God. The Roman Empire existed at the time of Jesus, but it, it just did not exist after about 400 and so AD. Praise God. But the Holy Roman Empire now was founded in 800 AD when Pope Leo III crowned Charlemagne as the first emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Praise God. Now from that time until now, the Holy Roman Empire has risen and fallen several times. So I'm asking you a question today. Could it possibly be that we're witnessing a revival of the Holy Roman Empire in these times? Amen. Let me get to that in a minute here. But here's the reason for its foundation. I'm sorry, the formation. The Pope desired to extend his influence over all the world, but he didn't have enough power to do so, praise God. So a Holy Roman Emperor desired the same thing. So they joined forces and formed a coalition so that they could accomplish their goal together. <clears throat> praise God. As a result, this kingdom of the two of them combining forces would become known as the Holy Roman Empire. So now this is where it gets interesting because the Holy Roman Empire has always been ruled by two men, a political ruler and a, and a spiritual leader. Praise God. But the, the Bible tells us that the last government that will rule the earth will also be ruled by two men, a political leader and a spiritual leader. Praise God. <clears throat> so we can see that the feet of iron and clay is a mixture of of politics and religion. Daniel 2.43, which we just read, speaks of this. It says that they will mingle with the seed of men. This is referring to religious forces forming alliances with political forces. Praise God. The verse goes on to say, they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. This passage makes perfect sense for each time the Holy Roman Empire has been established it only existed for a short period of time and then it fell apart. So each time the Pope and the Emperor would argue over who has final authority the alliance would fall apart. And history tells us that the Holy Roman Empire disintegrated in 1806 by the hand of Napoleon Bonaparte. But that may change in these end times, praise God. So the most important element of Nebuchadnezzar's dream is the stone. The stone which was cut out of the mountain and struck the image upon the feet. That same represents the kingdom of God, praise God. And it's confirmed in the scripture that I'm going to read here next, verse 44, it says, And in the days of these kings, so what kings is it talking about here? These kings that it's talking about is that the kings represented by the ten toes of this, of this prophecy. Praise God. So the, it says that the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Praise God. So <clears throat> Daniel also said that after it destroyed the entire image, the stone grew until it filled the whole earth. So that's a portrayal of the fact that during the time of these ten kings that the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Amen. God will have the last say. Praise God. <clears throat> so I think we can conclude a, a couple of things here. It's that the, the last human government to rule the earth will be a coalition of ten kings or ten kingdoms. Praise God. <clears throat> and most Bible scholars agree that there will be a ten kingdom or ten nation coalition which will likely come out of Europe, which was the seat of the old Holy Roman Empire. Praise God. So 
A Holy Roman Empire will most likely exist when Jesus returns. And if this Holy Roman Empire is being revived today, it would fit perfectly into Daniel's prophecy. Praise God. So, let me move on here. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I don't think I can talk about Bible prophecy without talking about the book of Revelation. Chapter 1, verse 3 gives us a good reason why we need to study Revelation. It says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep these things which are written in it for the time is near. What time is it talking about? It's talking about the coming of the Lord. Praise God. And you see that this is a double blessing here. Whoever reads Revelation receives a blessing, but it says whoever hears it also receives a blessing. Praise God. And I remember one pastor taught on Revelation. I really appreciated that. He said that he said that uh, chapter 1, verse 19 was a key verse in Revelation. So I want to read that. Chapter 1, verse 19. It says, Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. Praise God. So you write the things which you have seen. This is referring to the past. So that could be anything that John the Apostle had experienced throughout his ministry up until the time that he fell before Jesus uh, as a man that was dead when he had a vision of Jesus. Praise God. It could have been anything that had taken place up until that point. And then it says that the things which are, this is referring to the present and the things which will take place after this. This is referring obviously to the future. <clears throat> so in what I've seen over the years is that there are two basic questions that people ask about the book of Revelation. They want to know where are we in Revelation as far as the timeline goes. Has the book of Revelation, is, will it take place completely in the future or are we in the book of Revelation already? And another, another question people ask is that they want to know when the Lord will return. Will the in relation to the tribulation period. When will the rapture take place? So I'm going to attempt to give some insight into those areas. Praise God. So if you look at the entire book of Revelation, a couple of things become apparent. Chapters 1 through 3 talk about the church on the earth. Talk about the church on the earth. These are the things which are now. Praise God. But in chapter 4, something dramatic takes place. The church is no longer on the earth, but it's now in heaven. Praise God. So these are the things which will take place after this. Chapter 6 through 19 talks about the period of tribula tribulation. Chapter 20 about the millennial kingdom. Praise God. So to gain an understanding of where the church is today, spiritually speaking... I want to take a look at the seven churches in chapter 2 and 3. Praise God. So just bear with me. It's going to take me about five minutes to go through this. So try not to let your eyes glaze over. Praise God. The, remember now, just hearing this, you're, getting, you're going to get blessed. Praise God. So... The seven churches that it talks about in chapters 2 and 3, there's a dispensational interpretation, which means that it's talking about a dispensation of time, that each of these seven churches would represent seven stages or conditions of the church throughout history. So I just want to look briefly at each church, and I, I believe this is important for us to look at. Now the first church was a church at Ephesus. There, it was representative of the period from the day of Pentecost until approximately 100 AD. <clears throat> but this was called the Loveless Church. 
praise God. And which that's surprising to me because this is a church that Apostle Paul had started. Amen. But if you read the epistles of John, first, second, and third epistles of John, what is the main thing that John talks about in those letters? He learned to love one another. So I believe he was talking to this church at Ephesus. And those letters confirm that. Amen? Praise God. The second church was Smyrna. Represents a time period of 100 AD to 312. It was called the persecuted church. Which would have existed during the Roman emperor persecution. Praise God. And it, it was one of two churches that received no criticism from the Lord. Number three, the church at Pergamo, Pergamos, praise God, represented a period of 312 to 590. This was called the Compromising Church because it was involved in uh, pagan practices, amen? Praise God. Church number four was the church at Thyatira, represented a period 590 to 1517. This symbolizes the apostate or corrupt church. This was during... The time of the Dark Ages, praise God. The fifth church was church at Sardis, represented a time period of 1517 to 1740. This was called the Reformed Church, praise God. It started the Protestant movement by Martin Luther. But it was also called the Dead Church because it was void of the moving of God's Spirit, praise God. <clears throat> so now comes the church at Philadelphia. Now this is the church that we all want to be like. Amen? Praise God. This is the revival church, or the faithful church. And it was the only other church that received no criticism from the Lord. Praise God. <clears throat> but just because we want to be like the Philadelphia church doesn't make it so. Amen? Praise God. So the last church it talks about now is the Laodicean church which represents a time period of the 1900s up until today. And this was called the lukewarm church. Praise God. Now this, this represents a time when theologians began to turn to philosophies of men and turn away from the word of God. Now, people coming out of the theological seminaries today, 50% of them, it said, don't believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And 70% of these same people don't believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. So these are people coming out of these seminaries, men and women, that are going to be pastors in this country and other countries around the world that don't even believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Praise God. Now you wonder why it's called the lukewarm church. So why do we want to look at these churches? So we can examine our own church. Amen? To see if any of these conditions exist right here. Now we want to be the revival church like the Philadelphia church. But we have to pray that down. Praise God. So even if we're living in the Laodicean church age, we can still live and act like a revival church. Praise God. <clears throat> so getting back to those two questions that people ask about Revelation, the first question was where are we at in Revelation as far as the timeline goes? Where are we at chronologically speaking? <clears throat> so if we are in the Laodicean church era, that would place us at the very end of chapter 3. Because the church in chapter 3 is still on the earth. Amen? Praise God. So, think about that. The other question people ask is, when will the church be raptured or caught up? Praise God. <clears throat> in my, I have a study Bible at home, and... It has eight different interpretations of when the rapture will occur. So obviously not all of those eight are correct, right? Praise God. So I picked three of them. <laughs> These are the most common ones. The pre-trib, the mid-trib, 
in the post-trib. But the, the pre-trib model, praise God, says that the rapture will occur before the tribulation period. And I think we all know that the tribulation period is a seven-year period that the Bible talks about where, where the greatest time of suffering that will ever come upon the earth, praise God. So that pre-trib model says that the rapture will come before that period, praise God. So after the tribulation period will come the battle of Armageddon, and after that will come the second coming of Jesus Christ. Then the millennial period of a thousand years, and then the great white throne judgment, praise God. Now, in this model, the rapture and the second coming of Jesus are two separate events, praise God. Now, the mid-trib model, <clears throat> the rapture will occur after three and a half years or in the middle of the tribulation period. In this model, the rapture and the second coming of Jesus are also two separate events. But then we get to the post-trib model, praise God. It talks about the rapture occurring after the tribulation period. So in this model, the rapture and the return of the second coming of Jesus are the same event, praise God. <clears throat> so now the, the pre-trib model is by far the most accepted interpretation, amen? And I believe there are good reasons for that. I believe the pivotal verse in Revelation is chapter 4, verse 1. This verse reveals to us that the church is no longer on the earth, but is now in heaven. Praise God. Let me read Revelation 4, verse 1. It said, After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which, are, which must take place after this. Praise God. So there's two things you have to look at here. That John was being taken up to heaven... And that what started all of this was a voice that sounded like a trumpet. Now let me compare that to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Praise God. So this is telling us about the rapture. Praise God. But here too we have the church being taken up to heaven. And it starts with a voice that sounds like a trumpet. Praise God. So because of that, I believe that the chapter 4 verse 1 is talking about the rapture of the church. Now, if the church is raptured in chapter 4... The tribulation period doesn't start until chapter 6. So then the rapture would have to occur before the tribulation period. Amen? Praise God. And, and I know there's Bible scholars out there that say, well, the book of Revelation is not in chronological order. But what they don't mention is that the book of Revelation is in God's order. Praise God. I mean, there's a reason why God put Revelation in the order that it's in. Praise God. So, secondly, if you read about the tribulation in chapter 6 through 19, you clearly see that God's judgment and God's wrath will take place. Now, the one thing about God's judgment is God's judgment can come upon God's chosen people. I mean, an example of that is the children of Israel. I mean, God's judgment came upon them multiple times throughout history, but that judgment wasn't meant to destroy them, it was meant to correct them and bring them back to God. Praise God. But God's wrath is something completely different. God's wrath isn't meant to correct. An example of that would be Sodom and Gomorrah. God's wrath didn't come to correct the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, it came to destroy them. Praise God. <clears throat> So I can say then that God's wrath is meant for the wicked, not for God's people. Amen? 
And I believe that 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 confirms that. It says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. Now that would tell us that the church will not go through the tribulation period. But then there's one more thing. <clears throat> the church is mentioned 20 times in chapters 1 through 3 of Revelation. That's when the church is still upon the earth. After chapter 4, verse 1, which I just read to you, which is that pivotal verse, the church is never mentioned again until chapter 22, verse 17. And that's after the tribulation. Praise God. So that evidence would suggest then that the rapture will take place before the tribulation period. Praise God. <clears throat> but you know what? It doesn't make any difference what we think about the rapture or when it will occur. Because God's going to do what God's going to do. Praise God. So we might be shocked when we find out when the rapture is going to take place. Praise God. So, if we're at the end of chapter 3 in Revelation right now, the very next event to take place is the rapture of the church. Praise God. So, praise God. I'm, I'm going to close right now. And what I would like us to do, if we could all stand, I would like us to pray. Praise God. First of all, that we would be ready to meet the Lord if his rapture occurred today. Would we be ready to meet him? And secondly, I would like us to pray that God would open up our understanding about Bible prophecy. I mean, we just went over the basics tonight. But with God's understanding, we could move much deeper into, into the prophetic realm. Praise God. So why don't we begin to pray right now? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. God, we desire, Lord, to be ready for your coming, Lord. Your coming could be tonight, God. Hallelujah. God, speak to our hearts tonight, God. Help us to be ready to meet you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. God, I got that feeling, Lord. There's a feeling that the church, I believe, is beginning to have throughout the world is that the rapture is coming soon, sooner than what we might think. So help us, God, not to look at it as something that will occur way off in the future and that we have plenty of time to get ready for it. God, it may, be, it may be much sooner than what we think, God. It may catch us off guard, Lord. Hallelujah. Help us, Jesus, to be ready for your coming, Lord. Hallelujah. Help us, dear God. Let your mercy and your grace speak to us tonight, God. God, if there's anyone here tonight that's not ready to meet you, Lord, in the air, just like the Bible says, God, God, help us to get ready right now, Lord. God, it'll only take a few seconds, God, to get us ready to meet you, Lord. We ask that you would do it now, Lord. If any of us need to repent, God, God, we ask that you would help us to do that right now. In Jesus' name, praise God. Hallelujah. And God, I pray that our understanding will begin to be open, Lord. Hallelujah. In these last days, God, the prophetic is going to become more and more aware to us, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Things are going to be unfolded before our very eyes. We're going to be looking at things that we've never seen before, God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Your angelic hosts, God, are being loosed, Lord, in these last days just for this time, God. Oh, hallelujah. God, the devil will attack, Lord, but your spirit will be greater, God. Oh, hallelujah. Your spirit will drive the forces of evil back, Lord. So, Lord, we ask tonight that you would give us that understanding that we need, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. To accomplish your purpose in these last days, God. Oh, hallelujah. God, we love you. We praise you. We worship you. 
Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this house tonight, oh God. Hallelujah. God, just as you opened the understanding of the disciples, God, we ask that you would open our understanding tonight, God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, you're, with your spirit, we can do all things. We can understand things that we've never understood before, Lord. And during these end times, God, it's critical that we stay close to you, Lord. Help us, dear Jesus, to stay as close to you as we possibly can, God. Oh, hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this house tonight. Speak to your people, God, I pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's just bask in his presence for a presence for a moment. Praise God. Oh precious Lord. We thank you for your presence. We thank you, God, for speaking to us tonight. We thank you, precious Lord, for what you're doing in each of our lives tonight. We ask God that you would Go with each one here tonight as they leave this place, God. Let your spirit, God, continue to minister to your people even after they leave this place tonight, God. Let your spirit touch each and every one. God, watch over us and protect us, Lord. Hallelujah. Keep us close to you, God. Keep us close to you, Lord. Hallelujah. We plead your precious blood over each and every one now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God, praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You can continue to pray or you can be dismissed if you have to go. Thank you for coming in Jesus' name.